So good morning to one and all. I thank the organizers uh, for giving us this opportunity to chair this session. We have uh, three important topics for this uh, session. The first uh, session is going to be on insulin resistance, the correct target for PCOS uh, therapies. We all know that uh, in the reproductive age group women, the commonest um, endocrinological as well as the metabolic problem, what we are coming across is the polycystic ovarian disease and nearly 70 to 80 percent of them are insulin resistant. So I call upon uh, Dr. Mala Barmalingam to enlighten us on this subject. Uh, she is a professor and uh, head of department of endocrinology at uh, Ramaya Medical College, Bangalore. Over to Dr. Mala. A very good morning to all of you. It is my pleasure to be amongst you this Sunday morning. I thank the organizers and also take this opportunity to congratulate them on this wonderful scientific symposium. So my topic for today is insulin resistance, a, current, a correct target for polycystic ovaries. Anything to do with polycystic ovaries is interesting and controversial. So I'll take you through the data that we have on insulin resistance in polycystic ovaries and see what happens when we go to management. I have nothing to disclose with regard to this talk. And what I am going to cover over the next 20, 25 minutes is history, what its relevance to polycystic ovaries and when the association with insulin resistance was found out, its association with dysglycemia, its different symptoms and those associations with insulin resistance, and where all does insulin resistance happen in the pathophysiology of polycystic ovaries, and look at management of this pathophysiology and see where we are. So the association of androgen excess with metabolic abnormalities was known as long behind as the 18th century and was uh, described by Morgagni. In 1921, the famous case was established or presented where there was androgen excess with diabetes mellitus. This is that. This was by Thiers et, uh, et al. who reported the association of hyperandrogenism and insulin resistance. Now we have a lot of syndromes with hyperandrogenism and documented insulin resistance. In fact, if you look at the fasting insulin in all these syndromes, they were all more than 50 microunits per ml. And in fact, only in polycystic ovaries, shade less of less than 50. But even there, there was an insulin receptor defect, which we will look at. Now, if you look at data published, right from 1987, when there was, though insulin resistance was known from long back, like I said, 18th century, the documentation of dysglycemia and the reports thereon started only after 1987. And there have been huge number of data generated on the association of PCO and insulin resistance. So what are we looking at when we are looking at polycystic ovaries? We are looking at possibly anovulatory cycles, hyperandrogenism, polycystic ovaries. This is associated with obesity, insulin resistance. We look at some of the genetic factors also, which could possibly cause the problem. Now, if you look at prevalence of glucose intolerance, the prevalence of impaired glucose tolerance is roughly about 23 to 35 percent. Type 2 diabetes is about 4 to 10 percent. And this is three times more than the prevalence rates of that particular country. The race and the ethnic uh, differentiations persist. But in any situation, it is three times more. Can you imagine what it would be in India when we have such a high prevalence of diabetes in our country, and if you look at polycystic ovaries, and maybe then at by some time, all the women, uh, many of the women who are PCO will all be having diabetes, and maybe because one begets the other and the fetal also becomes diabetic, we are in a bad state. So, and as the BMI increases, this dysglycemia increases irrespective of the insulin resistance also. And about 70% of women, polycystic women are insulin resistant. The first was dysglycemia, and the last 70% are insulin resistant. Now, this was different studies from University of Chicago, Penn University, Mount Sinai, recognized uh, uh, institutes, which looked at some sizable numbers between 100 and 200, uh, 100 and 400, and what they found was prevalence of about what we have discussed, 
between 10 to 30 percent having impaired glucose tolerance and about 10 percent of type 2 diabetes. Now, what is the pattern of dysglycemia? This is very important for us practitioners who want to test. So what, what is recommended is to possibly do a GTT for everybody. Because if you look at this slide, you would find that the fasting sugar is reasonably OK. It's a very few uh, number of uh, triangles which are lying above 100. But the majority of the rounds and the squares are below the 100 fasting. But if you look at the postprandial, the majority of them are above. So what we are looking at is the postprandial hyperglycemia, not the fasting hyperglycemia. So if you do a fasting, you're going to miss many of the diabetics or impaired glucose tolerance pre-diabetes with polycystic ovaries. And even a HbA1c apparently is not recommended. So it is better that we do a GTT to pick up these patients with dysglycemia. Now, if you look at the other symptoms that I was talking to you about, irrespective of the duration of length, you know that it is min the polycystic ovaries don't have cycles for within six weeks. So anywhere between six weeks and six months, they have studied different, uh, uh, different periods of cycle length, and they have found that there is insulin resistance in every cycle. So any uh, mode of cycling, they do have insulin resistance as me measured by HOMA IR. Then it, a very important question next comes. Is it also present in lean ob uh, polycystic ovaries or is it only the obese polycystic ovaries which are uh, insulin uh, resistant? And this was another very elegant study done which, uh, which gave uh, 40 uh, grams, 50 grams of glucose and measured insulin resistance in all of them and they found that the insulin resistance was present both in the obese polycystic ovaries as well as in the lean polycystic ovary girl, adolescent girls. And it was more than just simple hyperandrogenemia. It was uh, much both in the obese as well as in the lean polycystic ovaries. A very good measure of measuring insulin resistance is insulin mediated glucose disposal how much the glucose is utilized when insulin is given. And what they found that in polycystic ovaries, there's a 35% suppression of this glucose mediated disposal at different parts. Usually what happens, it's a peripheral insulin resistance. What do I mean by peripheral insulin resistance? That means the insulin resistance is at the level of the muscle. So when this was known and they knew that the insulin mediated glucose disposal is reduced, then they go, went on to see what happens in different areas of insulin resistance, that is the adipocyte and the skeletal muscle and the liver. And what they found was in the adipocyte, it was definitely there was a reduction of the glucose disposal and more in the and more insulin secretion and at the muscle this was the most significant the glucose disposal was less and insulin secretion was much more and in the liver uh, there, there it is not so much if you see there in especially in the lean there's not much of a difference straight difference in the polycystic ovaries in the glucose disposal but in the obese insulin secretion was more but the most significant was definitely at the level of the muscle showing there was a more peripheral insulin resistance the other measures of insulin resistance is the glucose insulin ratio, the fasting insulin, insulin mediated glucose uh, disposal and the frequently sampled insulin GTT. These are other measures and all of them did show that in polycystic ovaries it was the insulin resistant measures were definitely higher. Now let's look at little at the molecular defect in polycystic ovaries. So if you look at this molecule level post insulin receptor binding in the signaling cascade pathway there is a problem so what is this problem if you see that that's where the defect is and the problem is that autophosphorylation of tyrosine does not happen what happens is the serine kinase pathway that gets stimulated and in this way, the IRS2 is not so stimulated as much as it should, and there is a decrease in the metabolism. So the 
post receptor signaling pathway is affected and what is very interesting is that it's the only metabolic pathway that is affected and how and the mitogenic pathway is not touched so nothing happens to the growth and cell proliferation but the metabolism is all slowed and that is why there is more insulin resistance so there is more serine kinase phosphorylation now if you look at beta cell function dysfunction if you see where the insulin sensitivity was measured and the insulin resistance was measured by the AIR and the, definitely there was there was decreased insulin secretion relative to the insulin resistance if the insulin resistance was more then definitely insulin was more but otherwise if, it, if you look at actual function there was reduction in the insulin secretion in polycystic ovaries now let's look at even lower level at the genetic level now if you look at the tgf signaling pathway and if you take look at the tgf ligands there are antagonists of fibrillin 3 and folistatin now this ligand tgf family ligands like the tgf beta 1 and the inhibin and activin they bind to type 2 receptor and this phosphorylates the type 1 receptor which auto phosphorylates mad and this causes problems in the insulin resistance at the level of the skeletal muscle as well as the ovary. So with this we have realized that at many levels, whether it's clinically or at cellular or at molecular level, insulin resistance is definitely a target and folistatin uh, mutant variant is a candidate gene for poly polycystic ovaries. Now, we have looked at it. Let's just summarize what are the problems. High causes of hyperinsulinemia is because of reduced insulin clearance. This is due to reduced number of function of insulin receptors. There's increased insulin secretion and there is beta cell dysfunction. And uh, the beta cell dysfunction is, uh, uh, demonstrates defects in beta cell entrainment to an oscillatory glucose infusion and decreased meal-related insulin secretory responses. So these are the major problems and at the molecular level there is activation of the serine threonine kinase instead of the tyrosine kinase and there's excessive phosphorylation of the insulin receptor. Now a little bit of the hypothalamopituitary ovarian axis because that is another uh, target that we are looking at and one of the pathophysiology, we, some say it's a pituitary defect, some say it's an ovarian defect and some say it is an androgen defect. So if you look at this, even here, what we find that there is an increased LH and because of the increased uh, LH that causes increased androgen and this androgen because of aromatization can cause increased estrogen and because of the increased androgen that is hirsutism and hair loss and this has a negative feedback mechanism at the level of the pituitary. Now insulin itself, it, uh, how does it affect the different parameters? It augments LH induced androgen synthesis in the theca cell, it augments GnRH mediated FSH release and LH release, augments FSH induced estrogen production and augments LH induced luteinization of the granulosa cells. So insulin not only works at the periphery, it also works at the pituitary level. So the pathways to link, if you look at hyperinsulinemia at the level of the liver, there is increased IGF BP1 and in decrease of SHBG, this leads to free IGF1 and free testosterone leading to hyperandrogenemia at the level of the ovary. And if you look at the pituitary, there is increased LH pulse, which again leads to hyperandrogenemia at the level of the ovary. So uh, there is hyperinsulinemia, there's premature LH receptor expression in the small follicles, premature granulosa terminal differentiation, arrest of follicular growth, and anovulation. And this is again to summarize the whole thing that I've been talking to you about, finally ending up that hyperinsulinemia does cause decreased SHBG production, increased ovarian androgen production, and decreased the LH-FSH ratio, that are the LH is increased compared to the FSH and leading to polycystic ovaries. So we have no doubt to say that there is insulin resistance. However, this is selective. Insulin action on glucose metabolism is reduced. The inf insulin action on steroidogenesis is unchanged. And this is because of the selective defect that we have discussed that it is metabolic and not mitogenic. And this is what I meant, that it is sent, the mitogenic pathway is not interrupted, but the phospho, phosphoinositol 3 kinase pathway, which is the metabolic pathway, is inhibited, and uh, that is why there is insulin resistance. 
But now, if this was such an important factor, then why is targeting insulin resistance not working like magic? This is something which we have not been able to understand. And if you look at results coming from this, there are mixed results. Some say it is good, some say they are bad. If you get 50 studies which say insulin sensitizer are good, there are 60 studies which says it's not good. So really we don't know why when the insulin, we have so much data that insulin resistance is a key factor, we don't have. So looking at some of the data, this is one from one of the most recent studies which was published just last month in Reproductive Biology and Endocrinology 2014 by Palomba, and she has done a meta-analysis of different studies from 2005 to 2013, and she has found that, and she looked only at those studies which could be compared, which had placebo controlled, which were uh, able to, which she was able to analyze, and she found that there was a favoring metformin in live birth, ra uh, birth rate outcomes, in pregnancy rate outcomes. This was again between 1999 to 2013 data of meta-analysis and favored metformin in pregnancy rate outcomes. And this was a study way back in 2003, which in fact started the, uh, the thing that metformin may be good for ovulation. This was another meta-analysis which was published in 2003. But then we got so much other data saying it is not good and it really has no benefit to add metformin uh, for ovulation induction. And uh, this is again recent data looking at adverse events of miscarriage multiple pregnancies, which again uh, Palomba et al. have shown that there is a favoring metformin result with, uh, with in this side miscarriage rates. Once again, if you look at all the other studies which were published through time and looked at what metformin did to regularization of cycle, ovulation rate, ovulation induction and pregnancy rate and pregnancy outcome, you can see some are so blank, some are going high, some are equivocal. So there is no consistent data. And to add to it all, most of this data was very incomplete, very small number of patients. Maximum number sometimes was 35, 40 in some of these studies. So really, we don't have too much data which could be analyzed properly. So it's, again, very controversial what it really does. But treating insulin resistance can reduce insulin levels possibly prevent future diabetes, potential for improved ovulation may be there, and definitely prevention of impaired glucose tolerance and diabetes. We have enough data to say 38% uh, prevention is there with metformin. So, and metformin reduces androstenedione and testosterone by theca cells, reduces LHR hormone, increased SHBG production by liver, and reduces insulin levels. And data, like I said before, with insulin sensitizers is disappointing, is not up to what we expect when we look at the basic science data, and lack of strong efficacy uh, to the way, maybe due to the variability in the patient's phenotype and metabolic parameters. So to conclude, there is definitely a strong association that, is, that cannot be ignored, and insulin may be considered a reproductive hormone, and insulin signaling in the CNS is critical for ovulation. It's an effective target for treating PCO, but takes longer duration for good outcome. So I would say it's an effective add-on therapy. It, I will not say it's the primary treatment, whether you're looking at symptoms or looking at ovulation induction, it can best be an add-on therapy. And it is not a substitute for lifestyle modification of in obese and over, overweight women. And diet and exercise should be again and again emphasized in polycystic ovaries. If you look at management, maybe 1 to 10 would be diet and exercise, and only 11 would be the other forms of treatment. Thank you very much.